Sri Lanka's dollar crisis and political crisis has left people queuing outside refueling stations for fuel. But of course, measures have been taken. We do hear of shipments on its way to Sri Lanka and uh, supplies being distributed to refueling stations. To discuss uh, plans ahead and how the developments will be managed within Sri Lanka, I've invited to our studios the Minister of Power and Energy, Kanchana Vijay Sekara. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Uh, I think um, it's, it's been a very short span of time since you um, took office as the Minister of Power and Energy. Um, but before we speak about the current um, the situation in Sri Lanka, is this something uh, you expected? And is, is this a ministry you believed uh, you could run when you were first uh, appointed? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on your show uh, this evening. Uh, no, not something that I expected uh, and not something I have been familiar with before. Uh, I was more familiar with working with the plantation sector and as well as the fisheries sector, uh, but I was given this responsibility uh, due to the uh, instability of the political situation that we had in the country. Uh, and there were some changes being done to the uh, cabinet of ministers. Uh, young members were given the opportunity to work, uh, and I never thought that I would be given this difficult task to manage uh, two of the biggest uh, issues that we are facing right now in the country, the energy sector and the power sector. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, it's been a very short time that I've been in this responsibility and uh, uh, we managed to, to a certain extent uh, to do the basic uh, things what we have lacked in the uh, last couple of years. Uh, but it's still a difficult task, it's a difficult job. Uh, I'm learning a lot of things as well on the job. Uh, but with the support that I'm getting from the President, the Prime Minister, uh, the entire Cabinet of Ministers and the entire government members backing uh, to take up this responsibility and even the opposition members who had been uh, helpful uh, in uh, continuing this uh, responsibility, it has made it a little bit uh, easier to uh, work in these difficult times. Uh, but of course something that I never expected but uh, it's always a challenge to take up something uh, this sort of uh, magnitude. Uh, were, were you the only young member appointed to the so-called uh, cabinet of young p uh, parliamentarians that was appointed after uh, the, the cabinet first resigned? Uh, not just me. I think uh, Dr. Ramesh Patran has always been in the cabinet from the beginning in 2000, uh, end of 2019. Uh, he has been a cabinet minister and one of the other cabinet ministers who was a part of the second uh, cabinet as well a couple of uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so both of us have uh, been reappointed to this cabinet uh, and I think I'm the youngest member appointed in this current cabinet. Uh, but of course there are a few new faces as well, uh, young faces. Uh, opposition members such as Harin Fernando, Manushan Anakkar, uh, new members uh, Roshan Ranasinghe uh, and also uh, members who had served before uh, like Dr. Ramesh Patirana, uh, is part of this group. So, uh, yes, I'm uh, a few of the members have, who have been reappointed, uh, but I think there'll be more appointments in the future. What, in your view, can you and the other young members uh, uh, who are appointed to the cabinet will do different to what was already done before by a, a more experienced uh, cabinet of ministers? Um, one thing we have tried to do is be transparent, mm. uh, communicate to the public uh, on availability of supplies. Uh, one of the main reasons uh, for our downfall or political instability or uh, this crisis to, um, to uh, be of this magnitude was the uh, miscommunication from the government mm. part. Uh, so if we had communicated properly uh, to the public uh, the situation that we were in, uh, probably uh, people would have understood this situation much more better. Uh, but miscommunication uh, was one of the biggest hurdles that we had in the last uh, few months. Uh, so one thing we have been trying to do is uh, the President, Prime Minister himself wanted us to be very transparent in everything we do uh, and to be honest to the public uh, and to explain the situation. 
So that's one of the changes that we have done uh, in the last uh, four weeks that we've been in this responsibility. And of course, it's still a difficult task. Uh, I don't think um, anyone taking this position uh, will have overnight uh, solutions uh, to how to overcome these two major crises that we've, um, it, it's not something that it has happened just over the last couple of months. It's, it's been uh, there for a few years. Uh, we have not addressed certain things. We have not done some of the groundwork that needs to be done uh, to uh, develop these two sectors. So we are facing all these difficulties with the economic crisis. So it's still a difficult task to continue. Uh, but of course, one thing that we've done so far is to be transparent and to be uh, truthful about the situation. Your party has held the majority power in parliament, uh, but yet didn't, uh, didn't you all gauge this uh, sufficiently? Or didn't the young parliamentarians raise this with the rest of the cabinet or with the party when, when the situation was worsening? No, we did. We, sp we spoke about these uh, situations within the group, but uh, when you are working with a government, when you are working with a certain party, uh, you have to have more responsibility how you deal with things. It's not that we can come out to the public and uh, criticize every move that we do. Of course, there were uh, instances where we had made our own observations, our requests. Uh, when Sapugaskan, the refinery, uh, was not operating, uh, for so many months, uh, most of our senior members as well as the junior members uh, made those concerns uh, why we should uh, not close down Sapugaskan the refinery and why we should continue to operate it. Uh, and there were um, certain requests as well, I remember uh, even a few months ago, uh, that we should give priority to renewable energy projects and that was one of the things that the President has stressed himself as well. Uh, but but who, who deterred all this? Who, who, who stopped you from taking these decisions? No, I'm not going to say that it's not the completely the responsibility of the government, but uh, of course the government, as a current government, we have to take some responsibility in it. Uh, but certain projects, uh, there are certain red tapes that we should have addressed a uh, long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in terms of our power sector, uh, right now we are still short of about 300 megawatts of power. Uh, but we have not addressed this issue uh, to set up a new power plant to, uh, to meet the current demands. Mm -hmm. Every year our requirements increase about 5 to 10 percent in the power sector. Uh, but unfortunately, since the Norachwale power plant uh, initiated in 2014, uh, we have not invested in large scale power plants in this country. So for the last uh, 9 or 8 years, uh, we have not invested on that and uh, we have not invested in renewable energy as such as well. Uh, so there are certain red tapes that we need to mm -hmm. take off as well. Uh, now one of the biggest hurdles for renewable energy projects has been uh, the Ceylon Electricity Board uh, Act Amendment, uh, mm -hmm. which has not taken place since uh, 2013, August 8th. Uh, so since then most of the new projects that were proposed uh, had to go through uh, a different process, uh, longer periods to obtain approvals, uh, certain new investments were discouraged. Uh, so working towards uh, the government policy had not taken place, not during our time, not during the previous government or during the previous governments before that. Uh, so now we have addressed certain issues and I hope with the new amendment that we are proposing to the Electricity Board Act, uh, which will be debated in Parliament, uh, on the 9th of June, uh, that we will have a much more easier way to uh, give approvals to certain renewable energy projects, uh, power projects that which will develop our sector. Um, I think uh, since you took office, we've seen, uh, in, in if, if we uh, understand, uh, observe the period since you took office, we see that um, the, the power uh, sector and, and the, the hours of scheduled interruptions have reduced. But what was done differently? What has the PUCSL and the CEB done different to uh, the time when we had 13, so sometimes up to 13 hours of uh, scheduled power interruptions? Uh, no, it's not something that uh, I have done to change anything in the system. Uh, it was, uh, we went into, unfortunately, we went into 12 hours to 13 hour power cuts. Uh, 
uh, because of failure to uh, address certain situations with the requirement of uh, fuel required for certain power plants. Uh, but of course now we have given a priority. I think it, it helps the uh, sectors as well when the energy and power ministries are both in one ministry. Uh, so we have managed to give a priority even though there is not enough adequate fuel uh, for fuel stations, we have given a make it a priority uh, that our power stations are given the adequate required amount of uh, furnace oil, uh, diesel oil and other fuels required to operate. Mm -hmm. So one thing we have made is uh, stressed is that the three and a half, a half hour power cut uh, should remain as it is or we should uh, try to reduce it. Mm -hmm. So that has been our uh, policy and working with the irrigation ministry to see that uh, whenever we have uh, requirements in the thermal sector and the hydro sector to work together uh, to find a mechanism how we can uh, manage the situation. Now we had a issue with the Norwich uh, one of its power plants uh, two weeks ago uh, where we managed to work with the irrigation ministry uh, to use more hydropower uh, so that we don't go into further power cuts uh, and to manage the situation and right now we are managing with hydro, thermal and the existing renewable energy projects uh, to maintain this power cut but of course uh, we would ideally like to see uh, the power cuts reduced so we are working on that as well, but um, one thing we made it a point was to give a priority for our power supply. Mm -hmm. So that's the change that we did with the ministries of energy and power uh, being in one ministry and under one minister. How much is uh, our fuel bill at present? Our fuel bill for the month of June uh, is estimated to be somewhere around 540 million USD. Mm -hmm. So uh, it has significantly gone up from uh, the previous couple of years. Uh, two reasons being, one, uh, we experienced the highest ever oil prices that we have experienced in the world for, I think, over two decades. Mm. And also the, uh, the dollar uh, appreciating against the rupee uh, considerably. We were at 203 rupees uh, uh, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And now we're somewhere in the range of about 360 to 365. Uh, so with the dollar going up daily uh, and the world prices also going up daily, uh, our full bill has significantly increased. And also with the power cuts that we are experiencing, uh, we've had to use more thermal uh, diesel powered stations. So we've had to use more fuel for our power stations as well as people are uh, obtaining more fuel for their generators as well. Mm -hmm. So. For that reason, our fuel bill has gone up from about 200 million USD, uh, which was about two years ago, to about 530 million this year. Uh, per litre, uh, the fuel price uh, at refueling stations have increased exponentially. But at the same time, don't you think this, this situation, uh, the burden on government coffers could have been eased if uh, the fuel pricing formula that was uh, brought into effect during the period of uh, the good governance government could have been implemented and continued with? No, absolutely. I agree that there should have been a fuel price formula uh, that we should have uh, considered uh, to uh, to revise the prices whenever possible. Uh, but I'm not sure if it is exactly the full price formula that was used by the previous government, uh, which didn't take into account all the factors needed to, uh, uh, to account for a full price formula. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course the need was there. Uh, and unfortunately, we also posted when we were in the opposition, we didn't understand the situation back then. But uh, now I think it's right time uh, to implement some of the things uh, for the betterment of the country because it's a huge burden on the economy. Uh, and I do understand uh, the difficulties the public has to go through every time there's a price revision uh, because uh, most of the people uh, to understand the price revision, uh, the two revisions that we have done in the last couple of months uh, was a significant uh, price hike as well. Uh, so we've enjoyed subsidies uh, throughout uh, since independence. Uh, so we should have uh, used a formula, not just for fuel pricing as well, but for other uh, tariff changes as well. I, I hope there's a uh, f uh, pricing formula that will be uh, implemented for the 
uh, energy sec uh, power sector as well. Are there any consultations or uh, discussions ongoing? Because we remember when Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe took over uh, during his very first address, he did say that uh, fuel pricing formula two will be uh, brought into effect. Yes, uh, for the power sector, we are uh, discussing uh, a pricing formula. Uh, but uh, for now, what we have decided or what we are discussing right now is not to uh, immediately do a 100% uh, conversion into a pricing formula. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time that we did a revision on uh, uh, electricity tariffs was in 2014. 2013, we had a price increase. 2014, we had a price reduction. Uh, since 2014, uh, we have not uh, done any amendments to the uh, generation cost or the tariffs that is with the electricity board. Uh, so it's going to be difficult uh, to do a one-off formula revision uh, for the nine years that we have not uh, revised our prices. Mm -hmm. So we want to gradually uh, bring it up to a formula. Uh, and of course, uh, we have to consider uh, certain sectors, um, low-income families, uh, people who use a very limited amount of units of power. Uh, so we have to take them into consideration as well. And of course, uh, uh, every sector, I, I think except for maybe one sector, every sector in this uh, country uh, gets a full, uh, sorry, power subsidy. Mm -hmm. uh, because our generation cost is right now about 48 rupees on average. Uh, but uh, people do enjoy uh, a subsidy on power generation. So what we are planning to do is uh, not put the entire burden on the public, but to see whether we can uh, reduce our generation cost uh, by going into more renewable energy uh, projects uh, to encourage them, uh, and also to do a little bit of a revision uh, so that gradually we will uh, cover some of the costs that is incurred to the CEB. Revision to uh, utilities, uh, the, the electricity, electricity tariffs. tariffs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and do you uh, have an understanding of when that will come into effect? Uh, no, because it's uh, currently it's been discussed. Uh, PUCSL also has a role in uh, the revision of prices, uh, the tariffs. Uh, CEB, of course, has made a request in this regard. Uh, but PUSCSL and uh, the cabinet has to decide uh, after the permission that is being granted from PUCSL uh, to go ahead with the price revision and what sort of price revision it should be uh, will be considered after it has been presented to the Cabinet of Ministers. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now we have not discussed uh, the rate revisions but of course we have re requested for a uh, price revision from PCSL. Uh, so once the permission is granted from the Commission uh, we can go ahead to the Cabinet of Ministers to decide uh, on how we are going to gradually uh, bring it up or how we are going to apply into a new formula. Uh, you did say that uh, we spend 48 rupees uh, uh, per unit of power generation and um, this was the government that came into power uh, pledging to improve and enhance our renewable energy sources. What took us so long? Uh, we heard of uh, a discrepancy in tender issuance. Is, is there any truth in it uh, after you came into power? You, you would have had the uh, um, opportunity to take a look at uh, these these agreements and how, how the ministry operates? Now, there's a lot of red tape in, involved in these renewable energy projects. Uh, now, there are certain instances where uh, people have given their proposals uh, with the required amount of land, uh, with the technical capability and with the financial capability to implement certain uh, renewable projects. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, when uh, the CEB or the CA uh, has to work as two different institutes, it's always going to be difficult to uh, give the necessary approvals on time. Uh, certain approvals have gone through a process of more than six years. Um, and once again, most of this is with the Electricity uh, Board uh, Act Amendment, mm -hmm. which was needed in 2013. But unfortunately, with one word, uh, that was needed to be changed, uh, which was not done in 2013. Uh, most of the power projects uh, which were scheduled to be uh, commenced or which were scheduled to be commissioned uh, did not take place. So we are hoping with uh, the, the red tape taken off, uh, the act amendments taking place next week in Parliament, 
uh, we will be able to reduce the, uh, the approval process from about a two-year period to about a uh, three-month period. Uh, so we can uh, give the go-ahead to most of these projects. Uh, and of course, there are certain projects uh, which have been given provisional approvals, uh, but people have not been able to implement them for different financial reasons or technical reasons. Mm -hmm. Certain people have obtained approvals uh, without being evaluated for their technical or financial capabilities. Okay. So both sides have contributed to that. Uh, but now we are evaluating every uh, approval that we have given. Uh, projects which we have given approval and not taken off, uh, we will be re-evaluating them. And if, the, if, it, if it is for the reason of uh, uh, reasonable price revisions that needs to be done, uh, rate revisions uh, with according to the dollar uh, or to the investment cost. Uh, we are open to uh, do rate revisions. Uh, but if it is for some re certain reasons with uh, necessary approvals not obtained mm -hmm. uh, from other stakeholders, uh, we will try to s help them uh, obtain those uh, necessary approvals. But if we don't, uh, we, if we don't uh, get approvals for those projects, we are going to communicate to them that that's something that we cannot uh, take it forward. So we have already uh, given approval at the Cabinet of Ministers to appoint a, a stakeholder uh, committee mm -hmm. uh, representing different stakeholders, Environment Ministry, Coast Conservation, uh, Wildlife, Forest Department, UDA, Lands Ministry, everyone coming into one committee uh, to evaluate all these proposals and to speed things up. Um, we did hear of foreign investors who were interested in renewable projects, uh, projects here in Sri Lanka, but were discouraged due to the very uh, bureaucracy and red tape that you've spoken of. Uh, do you have any uh, interests expressed by uh, investors in the pipeline? Of course, there are so many investors who had shown interest in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we should uh, give a priority. Uh, to those investors. Um, one thing our country, we are going through a power and energy crisis, uh, but the larger crisis that we are facing right now is the economic crisis. Uh, so if we are to uh, manage the economy, uh, of course we need uh, foreign uh, investment to come into this country. Uh, and I'm sure with the renewable projects, most of it will be uh, in the form of uh, equipment that will come in okay. as investment. Uh, but there'll be a portion that will come as uh, in monetary value as well. So we are trying to encourage most of the investors who had shown a keen interest in the past. Uh, we are going to evaluate them and no investor is going to uh, go through the whole process of uh, six year approval process to uh, start their investments here. And with the country uh, ratings that we are facing right now, the bank system uh, the ratings that we are facing right now, um, we have no other choice but to expedite certain uh, in possible investments. Uh, but of course, we have to evaluate them and see whether they are financially and technically viable to continue with the project. So we have uh, looked at certain possible investments, which we will be uh, signing in the next uh, couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are hopeful that we will work with uh, some of the friendly nations, development agencies, uh, who had shown a keen interest to support our power sector and also the energy sector to uh, bring in some foreign uh, income, foreign investment, and as well as uh, much needed uh, power and energy development uh, projects in Sri Lanka. Uh, the approval length being reduced from th three years to three months is certainly um, encouraging to foreign investors. But let's speak more on uh, the energy side of things in Sri Lanka when we return after this break. Do stay with us. We're in conversation with Minister of Power and Energy, Kanchana Vijay Sekara. You did tell us uh, that uh, there will be a rate hike, a possible rate hike, uh, tariff hike in electricity. But at a recent uh, media briefing, you also outlined uh, that, that high energy consuming um, segments such as industries and um, hotels will be charged more and there will be um, the low income earners who will be given some relief. But what of the households and how are you going to uh, manage this? 
Um, no, one thing we want the public to understand is that uh, there, sh there will be some sort of price revision. Um, so uh, the, n the, the message that we want to communicate was that uh, there are industries, there are hotels, there are uh, different sectors uh, who do enjoy uh, power subsidy okay. rates. Uh, we, we do, uh, our generation cost is about 48 rupees, uh, but uh, the industries do uh, only pay about 11.20 uh, per unit. Uh, so what we want to encourage them to do is uh, to use their roof space or their uh, facilities to go into more renewable projects. Mm -hmm. So that was one message that we wanted to communicate. If not, we will have to uh, unfortunately go into a price distribution uh, that will be very difficult for anyone to manage. Uh, so unless they start promoting their own entities to go into more renewable energy uh, or power energy saving uh, mechanisms, it's going to be very difficult for us you to sustain. You did say earlier too that the government will support with the rooftop uh, solar power uh, systems. How, how, how will that work? No, we, we understand that it's something that we need to do. But one of the biggest obstacles that we have for renewable energy projects right now is that uh, since August of last year, uh, some of the existing customers have not been paid their dues uh, by the CEB. Uh, and we are trying to figure out a way to make the payments on time. Uh, but one uh, option that we want to do is to remove all possible taxes and duty, which is attributed towards uh, solar panels and uh, the batteries and all the equipment uh, that needs to be that that is needed for uh, renewable energy or solar power generation. Uh, so with that, what we are hoping to do is that uh, we have spoken with the solar uh, association as well, uh, some of the companies who do large scale projects, mm -hmm. uh, for them to give a package so that uh, they can uh, they can fix the solar units uh, on the industries or hotels or any other buildings rooftop using their roof space uh, so that they can make a monthly payment uh, to cover the cost of installation. Mm -hmm. So uh, it will be an easy uh, payment plan. So what we are proposing to do is that the money allocated to pay uh, their current existing uh, electricity bills can be utilized to pay uh, as installments uh, towards uh, getting the uh, industries or roof space uh, fixed with solar power uh, generation. So that is one of the things that we are proposing. Of course, we are looking at possible uh, loan schemes as well. ADB has worked uh, before with the Ceylon Electricity Board uh, to, uh, to implement a plan in Sri Lanka. Uh, but we are looking at possible new proposed plans as well to work with certain banks to give some sort of um, incentive for people who wants to con con uh, convert uh, to give them that advantage to immediately convert into renewable energy. You recently launched the Rapid Renewable uh, Power Generation Plan, so this is part of that. Uh, but let's uh, move on to talk a little about uh, the fuel crisis that Sri Lanka is faced with. Do you have sufficient uh, foreign exchange to uh, cover the fuel bill in the coming uh, weeks? and months. Of course, you've indicated that uh, we have sufficient stocks for the to last the next three weeks, if I'm not mistaken. But you do also say that uh, the June uh, fuel bill will be around 540 million US dollars. Is this something Sri Lanka can manage? Um, right now, the stocks we have uh, with CPC and CPSTL, uh, and with the arrival of a new vessel a diesel consignment last night, uh, we have adequate stocks of petrol and diesel uh, until the 10th of June. Mm. Uh, but of course, uh, we have made uh, confirmations with other cargoes as well. Uh, so we are expecting a further uh, couple of shipments of diesel and petrol uh, to arrive in the country on the 8th of June. Uh, and also we've made arrangements uh, uh, with the balance money that we have from the Indian credit line for two more vessels uh, to arrive in Sri Lanka on the 16th uh, and 18th of June, uh, another diesel and a petrol consignment. Uh, so we are hoping uh, with the arrival of those four vessels that we will have enough adequate stocks uh, until uh, the third week of uh, June uh, 
uh, for requirements with CEB and the domestic requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we are still working on uh, the foreign exchange that is required uh, to obtain these, uh, uh, these facilities. Uh, as you correctly said, our full bill for the month of June is going to be about 530 million. Uh, right now we are discussing with the central bank, uh, the treasury and other relevant stakeholders uh, to see how we can uh, manage the situation. Uh, but of course we will work uh, a way towards achieving these targets. Um, and uh, right now uh, we are pretty confident uh, with the support of the central bank and the Ministry of Finance uh, that we will be able to uh, finance the requirements of the uh, the next four shipments as well as the other requirements of the month of June. Mm -hmm. So the Indian credit line will expire by the end of this month or we will uh, we will uh, run out of uh, funds from the relief r uh, line, is it? Uh, the two Indian credit lines that were extended to us, uh, the initial 500 had a balance uh, of about uh, 30 million mm -hmm. uh, from the 500 million. Uh, and there was a 16 million balance from uh, the 200 million that was extended. So the Indian government uh, has agreed uh, to extend that facility uh, with the balance being paid off in dollars, uh, so which amounts to about 40 million USD uh, for two more cargo shipments to be arranged to Sri Lanka on the 16th and 18th uh, of June. Uh, so we need to uh, make the payments of the 40 million required uh, as a balance payment. Uh, and of course the two uh, consignments that we are hoping to have on the 8th of June, uh, which we have confirmed with the suppliers, uh, will arrive in Sri Lanka and we have to make advance payments for both of them, uh, which will, will completely be depending on the Central Bank and Ministry of Finance funds uh, to pay the, uh, pay the cargoes. Mm -hmm. And also there is a, another consignment of Jet T1 fuel, uh, which is used by the aviation industry, uh, which is amounting to 49 million USD. Uh, which will arrive, scheduled to arrive on the 11th of June, uh, which we have to make the payments in the next couple of days. Uh, and uh, we are discussing with the central bank to facilitate that. Uh, and also there is another 500 million extension of a new credit line uh, that has been uh, approved by the Indian government. Uh, so the paperwork is being uh, discussed right now. Uh, so the Exim Bank will be the facilitator of this new loan as well. Uh, new credit facility, which uh, I assume will start kicking in uh, from the second week of June. Mm -hmm. uh, so once that kicks in, uh, bulk of our 530 million required for the month of June will be uh, from the Indian new credit line that has been offered. Uh, you said last week that the government is planning to um, settle on a, a 72.6 million US dollar uh, payment to purchase 90,000 metric tons of um, fuel, crude, uh, crude shipment, if I'm not mistaken, from uh, this, this was said to be Russian oil. But what's this controversy? Um, it was said to be Serbian oil, Russian oil. Uh, trying to understand, is this from Russia? Or, or how have you obtained this? Um, we are working with a company based in Dubai, mm -hmm. uh, which had given us a proposal, because usually how it works is that we do publish for tenders. Uh, and none of the tenders that we have published in the last couple of months have had people bidding on the tenders for the supply of crude oil. Mm -hmm. uh, and this particular proposal came of the way uh, from a Dubai-based company, a US company based in Dubai, uh, Coral Energy Limited, uh, which gave us an attractive proposal uh, that we pay in rupees uh, once the unloading takes place, uh, and we hold the rupees in account for about 30 days, uh, and then the central bank gives a guarantee for the 30 million, uh, uh, the, the rupees to be converted into dollars for them to take it back. Uh, but this crude oil is from uh, Siberia. Uh, it has been obtained by the, the US company based in Dubai. Uh, so it's directly not from uh, any Russian companies. Uh, so uh, it is a Siberian light crude oil that, has, uh, that we have managed to uh, obtain. Uh, and uh, we are working with uh, the company based from Dubai. Uh, but you have also requested Russia for support? Of course, we have requested uh, multiple countries, countries who produce oil, gas, coal, 
Uh, we have made uh, official requests from the Ministry of Energy and Power, uh, and as well as from the Prime Minister's office, uh, and as well as from the President, uh, if any assistance could be uh, extended to us uh, in this uh, situation. Uh, as you are well, uh, well aware that uh, our coal supply uh, for years have been from uh, Russian companies who have been providing for the Lakwija uh, Norochole power plant, uh, and we still do have a contract with them. Uh, they are, of course, working with uh, other companies based in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, so we have long-standing contracts uh, with certain companies. Uh, and, of course, we have requested from many countries. Mm. Uh, I personally met with the Russian ambassador uh, to see if any sort of relief could be extended towards Sri Lanka. Uh, we met with the Indian High Commissioner, who has been very helpful. Uh, the in government of India has been uh, uh, immense support to the Sri Lanka public. Uh, the Sri Lankan government uh, in terms of uh, not just fuel but uh, other facilities extended to us as well. Uh, and also we have spoken with other Middle Eastern uh, countries who produce oil. We have made uh, official requests uh, before I took office and I've made requests as well after taking office. Uh, we have requested the US also to see if we can uh, get some assistance. Uh, we have communicated to China uh, all friendly nations possible, mm -hmm. all development agencies possible, uh, anyone who can help with our situation, uh, we have made uh, requests from them. I, I stressed on uh, Russia, given the international concerns and possible embargo on Russian um, exports and uh, Sri Lanka, will Sri Lanka face um, any difficulties or challenges when um, receiving funds or support from Russia? Uh, right until now, we have not been communicated of any sanctions that have been placed on Russian companies or the Russian government to work with uh, the Sri Lankan government. Uh, as I'm well aware, I understand even yesterday, uh, the, the European Union could not come into an agreement uh, on Russian oil and gas. Uh, so we are working with companies uh, that have been given the license to operate. Uh, and uh, we had the similar experience with working with Iranian companies in the past. Uh, we were, uh, our refinery was depending on Iranian uh, light crude mm -hmm. uh, for many years. Uh, we had our refinery established with the support of the Iranian government in 1965. Uh, but after the sanctions kicked in, uh, when it was officially communicated to us, of course we had to adhere to certain, uh, certain regulations. Uh, and we started to convert into Merban crude and different other kinds of crude oil, uh, working with different other com uh, companies to uh, make our requirements. Uh, so until now, we have not been officially uh, communicated of such uh, sanctions or uh, such regulations. Um, and also uh, certain requirements, we will need to work with certain countries that do produce uh, oil, coal, and gas uh, to make sure that the uh, the basic needs of the Sri Lankan public is uh, um, given. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke of the refinery, Sapukaskanda, Sri Lanka's only refinery. Um, I think it came to a standstill um, on the 20th of March, uh, and recently you said that we will resume uh, operations in six days which should be uh, on Friday this week or Thursday this week. But w what is the status of it? We hear of a technical um, uh, difficulties that the uh, refinery is faced with. Yeah, plans were uh, to start operations yesterday. Mm -hmm. That was the plan that was originally uh, we had after we obtained the, uh, the crude oil from the uh, Dubai-based uh, US company. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, due to the closure, uh, uh, there are certain things, and it's it's a refinery which was built in '65 uh, and uh, needs upgrade as as well. Uh, but uh, the the technical staff, the the management of the refinery, had communicated that uh, they probably need another couple of days to uh, sort out certain issues, minor technical issues uh, that had come up in one of the two of the boilers uh, that they use in the refinery. Uh, and uh, the bad weather that we experience right now uh, is not helping the progress of the, uh, the management plan as well uh, because most of the work has to be done in the exterior. Uh, so uh, we are hopeful 
uh, with the work being carried out right now that uh, we'll be able to uh, operate the refinery as soon as possible. Uh, so we are hopeful maybe tomorrow we'll have some good news about the refinery uh, and it, it can commence uh, operations again. D does this mean uh, refined uh, petroleum and gasoline, uh, the, the refined version of uh, crude, uh, is convenient for Sri Lanka given the present uh, context rather than uh, having crude shipments brought into Sri Lanka? Um, you mean petroleum products being brought yes. to Sri Lanka? Yes, of course, because it, it, it is uh, less costly for us uh, to be producing uh, petroleum products, refined petroleum products in our refinery. Mm -hmm. And the amount of money we spent on wages and other management uh, maintenance work uh, it doesn't make sense to keep the refinery unoperational. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially with the uh, petroleum prices that we are seeing globally, uh, and we just saw yesterday that it has reached to the, uh, reached uh, another high in the last, uh, last few months. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes sense to start operations immediately, uh, and also it will reduce our cost of production. Uh, it will uh, also support our uh, power generation because there are byproducts that the refinery produces that we cannot obtain in the world markets, uh, especially things like naphtha uh, uh, and uh, furnace oil, uh, which should be much uh, expensive in the uh, global markets. Uh, we will be able to produce at our refinery. Uh, and once a refinery uh, is fully operational, uh, even if we do have gaps in our uh, shipments, uh, cargo vessels that we obtain to Sri Lanka, uh, we will be able to manage with the stocks that we produce daily uh, to manage the, the requirements uh, of the public. According to findings of the Committee on Public Accounts uh, in 2016, uh, there were about 5 billion barrels of fuel and about 5 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in the Mana Basin. Uh, which is uh, believed to be insufficient to meet um, energy demands for the next 60 years. Um, what's the status of uh, oil exploration uh, in the seas of Sri Lanka? Uh, there have been a few studies done, uh, especially around the Manar Basin. Uh, but what I understand right now uh, with the authority, which is uh, looking at the interest of uh, oil exploration and gas exploration in Sri Lanka, is that uh, we have made a plan uh, to make it available to uh, possible or suitable uh, oil companies mm -hmm. who are willing to invest uh, money and time uh, to do the necessary uh, exploration uh, to see whether we could uh, utilize some of the resources that are available. But I'm not in a state to say uh, what sort of resources that we will be able to get uh, from these explorations. Uh, there have been certain reports, uh, but I want to be sure that uh, once a company start operating in Sri Lanka, uh, which we will be making available uh, to a lot of uh, interested companies who have shown interest uh, in continuing uh, their investments in Sri Lanka uh, in oil exploration and gas exploration. So once that commences, it's uh, still going to be a six year, at least a five to six year period until they uh, can obtain uh, the necessary gas or oil uh, which they recover. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's still uh, in an experiment or a, a exploration status. Uh, so we are not able to say what sort of stocks that we will be looking at. Uh, but of course we are ho very hopeful. Uh, and not just the mana basin. Uh, what I understand is that there is more potential uh, towards the south of uh, mana. Uh, towards the, the deep seas in uh, Colombo, uh, towards the south, mm -hmm. uh, and also towards the east coast as well. Uh, so there is a few companies who had shown interest. Uh, there are some uh, government to government uh, oil companies who had shown interest as well. Uh, but we want to make it a transparent mechanism so that we allow uh, uh, anyone who has the uh, technical capability and the financial capability to uh, invest their time and invest their money uh, doing the exploration one if it of course benefits the country uh, we are open to doing that and we hope to uh, finalize a mechanism to uh, open it to any oil companies who wants to come and do their work here. I have just a couple of minutes on the show but uh, how much do you get a litre of petrol do you get it still at a subsidized rate? 
Uh, no, I think that was uh, something completely misleading that was uh, on social media and some of the media stations as well. Uh, everyone gets the uh, fuel at the price that we have set it at CPC. Uh, there is no particular sector uh, in Sri Lanka that gets subsidized uh, rates other than the rates that we have advertised uh, by the CPC. Uh, but uh, of course there was some misunderstanding that uh, the parliament members or the politicians exp uh, um, had the opportunity of uh, obtaining fuel for subsidized rates. That's completely false and misleading. Uh, everyone pays the same amount at the pump. Uh, and everyone will do the same thing in the future as well. Uh, finally, how do you uh, see the future uh, for energy and power in Sri Lanka? We understand these are difficult times. Uh, Sri Lanka is in dire straits. But how do you observe us managing uh, the situation going forward? Where will we be? Uh, you, you continue to make calls to people not to queue outside refueling stations. But there is a demand because people are trying to get to work, to get their day-to-day life going, um, how will we uh, manage this situation? Is this crisis manageable? Of course it's manageable, but I do understand the frustration uh, of the people and uh, the government has lost credibility uh, in the communications that we have done in the past. Uh, but of course uh, management is possible, it's not going to be easy, uh, it's a very difficult task but can be achieved. Uh, but we need to understand that there are certain things that we need to do uh, in order to achieve that. Uh, political stability, financial stability is a must uh, for these two sectors to have some sort of management plan and to have some sort of stability as well. Uh, but what we are working right now is to see that uh, the power sector is given more priority uh, so that people will have uninterrupted power supply. Once the power supply is restored, uh, I believe the demand for fuel for generators and the demand for fuel uh, for people, uh, for other activities or stocking uh, will be reduced as well. Uh, so we are focusing on uh, power generation as a priority and also making uh, fuel widely available uh, in adequate stocks uh, to the people, to the public and to also communicate to them properly. Uh, sometimes we do ask not to queue up because we know that certain days are uh, it's going to be very uh, difficult to distribute as we plan uh, but of course uh, we are hoping next three months is going to be a very difficult period uh, but we do understand the frustration and the worries the people the concerns the public has uh, but we are doing our best to manage the situation I'm hopeful confident uh, with long-lasting plans, stable policies, uh, that we will be able to achieve that. Thank you very much. We had with us the Minister of Power and Energy, Kanchana Vijay Sekara, joining us here at Hyde Park on Other There Are No 24 to discuss Sri Lanka's power and energy crisis and the political and economic crisis and how Sri Lanka can manage to come out of the present challenges. Thank you for watching. Have a pleasant evening. Good night.